Good evening, everyone, uh, dear friends, and good to see you again, and welcome to the first uh, APF First Friday of uh, 2022, and uh, happy Lunar New Year, and it's a good uh, way to begin by, you know, discussing uh, about the future of Asian elephants, you know, it's just uh, fits in as we uh, celebrate the uh, Chinese New Year. And I would like to quickly introduce to you, of course, our speaker for our APF First Friday this month. Russell Clements is the first place winner of the 2021 Association of Professional Futurist Student Award PhD category. Russell is a civil servant, retired civil servant with a bachelor's degree in uh, business studies, uh, specifically uh, information technology, and a master's of arts uh, in future studies. He is a PhD candidate in the future studies at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Uh, his research focuses on the future of uh, the Asian elephant species, now listed on the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List of Endangered Species. The research is focused on possible Asian elephant extinction in the 21st century and how this can be mitigated through transformed social systems, worldviews, myths, and metaphors spanning East-West uh, divides. So without further ado, on to you, Russell. Uh, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending my uh, talk. Um, and uh, happy Lunar New Year. I think it's the year of the uh, water tiger. I'm speaking from Perth in Western Australia. It's about uh, eight, uh, not eight o'clock in the morning. Um, firstly, this uh, talk is centred on the paper that, that uh, won the first place in the 2020 PhD student category, but I'm also extending on since then, since it was written in late uh, 2019 uh, and published in early 2020. I'm going to share uh, where, I, where my thinking has gone since then. So it, at the time when this was uh, published, uh, my principal supervisor was uh, Professor Sahail Inigatula and uh, Dr. Marcus Bussey. Um, and uh, I'd like to say appreciation to the people in the editors at the uh, World Futures Conference for, uh, uh, sorry, World Futures uh, Re uh, Review for uh, publishing the paper. Um, in 2021, I also published a short 1800-word overview, which uh, is circulating around and seems to be quite popular. It, uh, originally, I aimed at 40 minutes or 45 minutes, but uh, the last minute advice is I actually have the hour and a half to, to do it. So last night, I uh, extended it out and took a few more slides into it. And hopefully, I'll get through a bit quicker this time, but um, and more impressions and less information. So very quickly, uh, there'll be six sections, uh, research background, a bit of a prologue of how I got into it, uh, the elephant context on the ground, the CLA overview, the SES, which is the Social Ecological Systems Model, uh, developed by Alan Wallstrom. Uh, some work on uh, some work on Gregory Bateson or Gregory Bateson's work, which is the purples all the way down aspect. And then at the end, what's in it for future for professional futurists? Uh, I'm taking the right road, the complex area. It's going to be a discussion and the metaphor. I'm afraid it's going to feel a bit like an elephant in a V dub in terms of Act, uh, act content, but uh, by the end of it, I'm hoping to move from uh, any sense of fragmented pieces towards some sort of aesthetic uh, stained glass metaphor uh, uh, it, with an aesthetic of harmony to it. So very quickly, let's just take three minutes to uh, start uh, a video which will uh, set the, the whole uh, spiral theme which I'll be using throughout the talk, so hopefully it'll work.
Yeah, so, okay, so hopefully that uh, just sets the tone and uh, the spiral metaphor will be used, or uh, theme will be used throughout the talk. Um, just to point out that a later version of the uh, same person's work points out that that uh, linear line of the sun travelling at a higher level is actually a spiral itself within the, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, in that time frame, uh, we've basically travelled the distance of Perth to Singapore or Perth to Sydney, New York to California, whatever those uh, uh, locations mean. And uh, basically from there on, uh, let's look at the problem in three pictures that I'm looking at. It's framed in the double bind ethic that uh, Gregory Bateson is uh, quite famous for. And I've summed it up as just corruption ink. This is just the, the machine working, grinding away at the natural environment from the con uh, conservationist perspective. And the problem is wicked, complex, and graded. And the escape from the double bind uh, from a futures perspective has got to basically be ridiculous from our current perspectives. And on that basis, I've used this flying elephant uh, metaphor. Uh, I started this uh, quest, I suppose, back in, in the 1980s. Uh, shows my vintage, but I visited Nepal and India for some time and noticed the temple elephants uh, with their feet in chains, not particularly happy, and yet the whole uh, Indian ethic, uh, which I'll just use as the, as the code for Hindu and, and Buddhist uh, Dharma, um, it seems to be there's a gap there and I just I didn't quite understand it. Uh, again, in Sri Lanka in 2018, I visited Colombo, uh, a temple and I had the privilege of meeting a couple of elephants directly. Uh, at the same time, or just a few weeks before, uh, an elephant that had been uh, brought from uh, Cambodia as a gift uh, actually killed the uh, senior Buddhist monk who was performing the morning rituals. And he's actually the vice chancellor of, the, of a local university and connected with universities in the UK. So uh, Around that same time, the Sri Lanka's public sector auditor uh, uh, general retired. He'd spent many years in, uh, in the United Nations and had a secure uh, pension, and he was quite happy, uh, quite happy to speak truth to power. And uh, not long after, but in the same sort of vintage, uh, Ashish Nandi in, in, uh, in mid-2019 uh, Talk about the nature of the social organisation changing in India and the losing of the human touch and hysteria, which he at the time mentioned, uh, thought had disappeared in Europe. I don't know if that's still the case after the COVID pandemic, um, but it was often diagnosed as a defence against uh, more serious schizophrenia as a trend. And uh, operate, oppositional defiant disorder was often, the, often uh, uh, diagnosed as depression. Uh, the takeaway here is just whom the gods would destroy, destroy their first mate mad, which is uh, Prometheus speaking. I took this uh, situation of concern, I suppose, to the APFN in Bangkok in late 2018 and spoke to uh, Professor Sahail Iniyatullah about the uh, Sri Lankan elephant complex, which is a good book to read if you, uh, for anyone who wants to have a deep insight into the 25 years of civil war that went on in Sri Lanka. And uh, some of the media or the social media included the sentiments that the elephants were angry, were sentient, and they knew, and there was some sort of war and attrition going on, conflict going on. And I uh, attended the uh, three-day CLA workshop, and the which includes a sort of a guided meditation. And I started with the elephants feet in chains as our minds, in a sense. And it transformed in that process to flying elephants. I wasn't overly impressed to start with, but it did develop later on into uh, basically the complex futures plane, which I'll be using throughout the talk. Uh, the transformational turn is, again, using this jungle machine grinding out the money uh, uh, image, uh, being, trans being rotated around and reversed, or at least governed and balanced, and using this modern magical monetary tree theory, um, whatever it's called today, and, and bringing that back in as a mechanism for rewilding and creating a balance between the economic and the, uh, and, and the environmental area. So if we look at uh, the picture of the Bangkok airport, we can see the, uh, the churning of the milk ocean uh, creation myth and the uh, fashion shops just behind it. 
this reminded me of uh, the Canadian Harold Innes in the 19, I think 1930s, uh, did his PhD on the links between the Canadian fur trapping uh, industry and uh, the women's fashions in Paris. And, not, and, and we're in a similar sort of mode here, and that's really what I'm looking at. Uh, we can use the Indian, uh, Hindu, uh, uh, kind of, um, sorry, I've lost it, the uh, Milk Ocean uh, myth. And one of the nine to 14 ratans or gems that uh, emerged from that is the elephant or the white elephant that became the uh, vehicle or the uh, the Vana for uh, Indra, which is the uh, equivalent of Zeus in the Greek myths. Um, now, if we just quickly move on to uh, a quick overview of the African versus Indian elephant. Uh, I, I won't go through the list, but there's ears are different, the trunk tips are different, the heads are different, and there's a slight, the slight is smaller. The, the key thing to look at is the backs. The African elephant has a sway back, and the Indian elephant has a, uh, an arch back. Uh, and I just point out that their ears are actually part of the only one of the few parts of the body that, that can uh, release heat. So that's often why they're flapping their ears. They're trying to cool down and probably uh, just gave early people the thought that they might be flying like birds. And they're on a tree. There's already two species that have been become extinct. And uh, the forest elephants in Africa are also uh, close to extinction on the red on the register, too, mainly through poaching. Uh, they've got strange cousin, cousins, the dugongs and the man, man, manatees, and the hyraxes, a theory of land on them in Africa. Uh, they have theory of mind, that means they recognize themselves in mirrors, uh, their brains are quite large, and they are uh, estimated to be about the same intelligence as the great apes, and equivalent to about an eight-year-old human child. And this targeting really is the theme of my research, is, is all these interweaving and braided uh, vectors that are causing this particular problem. So the Asian elephant is on the uh, red list. Uh, there's a total population of about 40 to 45,000, and approximately 30% live in captivity. Um, the zoos, there's about a thousand worldwide. And there are early trends uh, you know, uh, towards sanctuary parks in this. Uh, one in Cambodia, uh, one in Thailand, and one in Brazil, and probably other places. Uh, Sri Lanka, I think, has one too. Uh, can elephants fly? Well, they sure can, a pun on words there. But um, uh, this, the last elephant in Pakistan was airlifted to uh, Cambodia, uh, tw 25,000 acre uh, Cambodian sanctuary, uh, in, uh, by a cost of about half a million. And also another billionaire. Uh, the Microsoft, well now deceased Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen uh, funded an elephant Afri uh, African elephant survey. So the good people out there doing good work. Uh, the Asian re regional extinction process has been going on for a, uh, quite a while. Uh, evidence exists of their uh, existence in around Syria, down to the Nile Delta, uh, north into the into northern China, and in Java, as far south as Java. They're now extinct areas, and it's like a uh, uh, Fortnite Battle Royale uh, computer game with a shrinking safe zone and a growing storm. I'll just point out what I call the Zoastrian line, because I use that through the talk as well. Uh, to the west of that, going towards Europe, the metaphors of elephants tend to be negative. Uh, they're, they're sort of, it's the elephant in the room, and they're, they're, it's the white elephant. Whereas to the right of that, going uh, eastward in India and Sri Lanka and, uh, and Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, it's a positive. Uh, and so I've used that as an interesting aspect to, to focus in on. If we look at the actual distribution of habitat, it's very fragmented. These are just remnant bits of forest left uh, from the early days. Uh, in India, many of them were actually res uh, reserved by royalty for the military. You know, elephants don't tend to breed in captivity, and that's part of their breeding process. Uh, they were used in, in the early days as tanks, or equivalent of tanks. Uh, lost advantages under the uh, fast horse place invasions. Mark Elvin in 2004 uh, developed a, uh, the elephant retreat out of China. There's only about two or 300 left in the southern provinces of China as an indicator for environment. And I'm using much the same approach, except my, my focus is on the futures. If we look at the litany, litany and it's just basically uh, it's plenty going on in the social media realm, it comes down to humanity managed thyself. 
and we can see that there's a growing population in India where the main uh, main centre of elephants reside at the moment. Um, and I won't read this, but there is in Sri Lanka about 80 to 100 people and about 250 to elephants die each year through human elephant conflict. In India, it's about 400 and 100. Um, there's lots of agricultural impact. I won't read that. Uh, and often the destroying of the houses is interesting because they do like alcohol. And uh, so they're not, they're not attacking people. They're actually vegan vegetarians, uh, six tons. Uh, but they're knocking down these, these village uh, houses at the alcohol stills and the food they can smell. Um, so there's, it's disproportionate uh, uh, conflict um, about the subsistence farmers on the edge of these uh, uh, forests are losing about uh, 10 or 12 percent of their annual grain. Uh, and the elephants are actually part of the common. They're uh, in India, at least, they're uh, owned by the government in a sense. And so the comp and part of the main problem is that uh, for, for conflict and retribution is that the, the government compensation for loss doesn't arrive. And this is the corrupt systems and all the rest. Hopefully that can be addressed. In Thailand, there's not many statistics, but there's a difference in uh, plantation owner perceptions, which are much more aligned with the, the Chinese scenario. I just get rid of them. Uh, now onto the CLA very quickly. Um, this is a, a layered approach. Um, Sahel uses the iceberg analogy. And on the, on the surface, uh, what we see in the papers, the litany, uh, we can do a systems or so social systems analysis underneath that. Uh, within that, we can look at the worldviews, that it's the context that these are happening in. And then within that, uh, we can look at the myths and metaphors and, that are operating. And this is where the change, if we can change the myths and metaphors, it can be then reflected back up to a new narrative and new key performance indicators to, uh, to drive policy and, and implementation management. It's an open, uh, open system or approach. It combines empirical and, and uh, subjective data. It creates a, uh, transformative spaces and uh, assumes that there's a strong inf uh, influence of um, the way policy should emerge if it's framed correctly. And it pr promotes a culturally self-aware interpretation of the future, which is what I'm trying to do with my research: is focusing how this uh, how this can uh, uh, meet the cultures of Southeast Asia or South and Southeast Asia. The causal layer analysis is uh, research is going to be in three case studies: Sri Lanka, Thailand area. Uh, there's an environmental scan, then a social ecological systems. Uh, interpretation and this talk and current research has been working on the critical discourse analysis, analysis and thematic analysis. So Hale also uses the futures triangle, which is a push uh, of the present, the hustle of the day, uh, the pull of the future, the allure of the future, and the weight of the past or the history that uh, drags, drags along. Um, we can see this fits into the futures uh, studies area through critical futures, and basically there's a common culture uh, and ethic across uh, the three the three case studies. Um, but there are some differences in the economic and political domain. The research problem is looking at the absence of a dialogue or communication between human geography, conservation, science, and public health. But of course, there's, there's also other other uh, disciplines involved. And the uh, research gap is basically um, this problem of uh, within the Aust uh, Eleanor Ostrom's social ecological systems is the treating of elephants and humans separately and not as a relational uh, uh, system. So that's the core of my research. Um, the context is pretty straightforward. It's human population increase, particularly around elephant uh, habitats. It's modernising of Asia, it's climate change, and particularly if the monsoons fail, there'll be increased tension there. It's that natural habitat being fragmented and poaching that goes on. And political realm, it's, it's all the post-colonial political complexity, confusion, and of course, corruption, which uh, isn't just Asia, that's worldwide. Uh, the research disciplines involved, at least in this researcher's focus, uh, as again, it's the human geography, the public health area and the conservation science 
but where they overlap, there's uh, large gaps big enough for elephants to fall through in, in a way. And uh, uh, thanks to Marcus Pussy, that I've, th these are called futures gaps. And I'm using this to also link it towards the end of the talk with uh, the elephants in the staff common rooms of the universities and education institutions that are producing the scientists who can't see the elephant in the room, or at least I shouldn't say that, I should say they, that they would benefit and elephants would benefit if they could see the elephant better. The problem and the solution, well, the situation of concern has three main system aspects. That's endangered species, uh, desirable solutions, less conflict, and cultural, cultural feasibility factors. That's the Hindu most friendly ethic. Preferred futures have three critical aspects. There's technical solutions, which we'll see as the hazard reduction. Uh, we see that uh, we'll also see uh, practical application in the outrage management. This is the uh, total risk communications model that we'll get to later. And there's cultural emancipation, which I'm looking at as humans and elephants. That's sort of meta bottom line is less blind humans and more elephant voices in policy uh, formulation. A quick, quick overview of the CLA. Uh, I won't go through it in great detail. It's effectively uh, human elephant conflict is a, is a good rubber hitting the road uh, focus within the, within the whole area. Uh, the social systems are basically corrupt government systems or inefficient and very, very complex organizational cultures that uh, are from the elites in, in countries have. Um, gone to Western universities, universities and the mix is, is very complicated and complex. Uh, there's also this double bind competition between social and economic, this, what I mentioned at the beginning, this uh, uh, Gregory Bateson's double bind approach. In terms of worldviews, it's pretty much binary all the way down. I won't read the list. I sum it up to say that most of it is all is actually this binary, but except one, which is the, the host nation form or the host culture, particularly in India, and I'll just use India as the case that we focus, where it's actually a trinary system uh, at the folk level. And this we'll see more as uh, relevant to this Celestian line, which to the West, as I mentioned before, is all about taboos and using elephants to uh, identify political power and political uh, uh, organizations or the white elephant in the room, whereas to the east, it's about the sacred gods and symbols. The escape is some sort of meta escape, and I've used the Indian folklore of the six blind men uh, trying to describe the elephant, and then how do we use this? And in my case, the elephant in the room is the flying elephant. Where did demonization of elephants come from, at least in the Western ethic? Well, I've I think it traces back to Zoroastrianism, Zoroaster in about the sixth century BC. Uh, where the whole universe was, decide, was uh, uh, defined as binary opposites, and elephants were classed as, as demons along with wolves and lions and others. So uh, in China, they also disappeared as well, but I think that's much more pragmatic and business-like the plantation owners of, of Thailand. So I think that's just uh, tactics that were used or we see as being used. And in the end, I've just wrapped it up as agricultural policy and projection. But uh, this, this Zoroastrian binary perspective, uh, I think, floats through uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, Islam, and even and pops up in Rene Descartes in, in the uh, Enlightenment, which we'll be using later on. And effectively, I just note that Peter Drucker's view of the change from the leadership of the past, where uh, it, you know, uh, messengers of gods were telling the people how to go. The leaders of the future will be much more people who know how to ask the right questions. Helen Rostrum, um, I've seen her a bit like the uh, the Oracle in, in the Matrix, but uh, anyway, she she was the first woman to win a uh, receive a Nobel Prize for in economics for effectively redefining the tragedy of the commons. And uh, very quickly, it's it's a simple systems approach, but uh, I think uh, uh, rightly fits the economic uh, discipline. Uh, it's very anthrocentric. Uh, there's resource units of whales and elephants. There's resource systems. There's government systems and there's users, humans, and there's outcomes. But it lacks a critical dimension. And uh, this is where it's a bit of a Rosetta Stone. And I think this is where my research is really going to uh, arrive on the ground, is redefining some of these and making them critical. And then it can fit in as a sort of a template with uh, 
areas like post-ecological discourse, which recognises 10 dimensions. Uh, very quickly, it's just a, a set of headlines or he, uh, headings, a, a taxonomy, I suppose we call it, with different things. And underneath these are various sub layers which can be tailored to particular circumstances. If, I just, if we just look at the actors, the question is how do we fit in the critical, um, the critical futures aspect? And one of the ways of doing it is looking at history and past experiences, the mental models such as CLA and future, critical futures thinking, but also uh, looking at uh, elephants not as resources but actually as as uh, actors, you know, the nine year, the eight or nine year old child, effectively. So this is the question that I'm doing. And hopefully by the time I finish this, then that will be the, the end of the uh, PhD dissertation. Effectively, the SES recognises three categories of, of knowledge, systems, target and transformative. But uh, the, uh, these fit into the CLA and, and Bateson's learning levels, which we'll cover a bit later. Uh, fairly well. Uh, also, they, they recognise that uh, it can be tailored to different circumstances, uh, different industries, uh, but there is very little research, or at least it remains elusive as to how they generate all these three together. It's extremely focused on just systems. The structural deficits, as I said, is targeted knowledge. Well, that's the cultural aspect of the CLA and layer three, the worldview. Uh, transformative knowledge, well, that's uh, the CLA myth and metaphor area where we can transform metaphors. Um, but there's minimal published research in these areas. And basically, I guess because the empirical scientists involved in elephant-human conflict are really coming out with, this, with, a, with a very common view that just more systems is what you need and better systems uh, will lead to policy and management decision change. But this is not the case, and, uh, and I think this is where there's an opportunity for people to go in who are literate in this area. To sum this up very quickly, uh, the CLA approaches thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, which will be labeled as sustainability at this, at this stage. It's business as usual versus more than that. It's uh, agricultural policy, Persia and China, versus a conservation policy, which is mainly embedded in uh, non-government organisations. And a focus, which is my research area, of how to make critical this uh, social ecological system, which is a communication system with economics and across the empirical sciences, and uh, quite useful. Uh, elephants are evil versus they're good, and elephants are basically, I don't know, but more than science anyway, so I suppose that's the future. And we can say that uh, instead of being demons and pests, or God, uh, say, that's a white elephant in Thailand, by the way, um, or gods or sacred symbols, uh, they are animal resources uh, working for their lunch like all of us, but they are also a companion species. And perhaps we can look at the future as being less of the uh, used future of dragging logs around and, and use their uh, hyper, um, hyper sense of smell to uh, help in medical areas and that sort of, that sort of thing. Gregory Bateson, uh, this is the beginning of the turtles all the way down, but his view was that all experience is subjective, and he's not talking about reality as, as an ontology, but our interpretations of it. His key phrases were the patterns that connect, you know, double description, double bind, and ecologies of mind. And so we'll quick run through that very quickly. Uh, he came up with the concept of framing as a spatial and temporal Binding, binding, that's space and time, and a set of interactive messages or communication, if you like. He came up with the double bind in the 1950s to help explain schizophrenia, and the, his research shifted the focus from the thing to the relation. It wasn't very hard to, uh, to marry it with CLA because uh, it, during the Second World War, Bateson was a professor in, uh, in a New York university where uh, a lot of the French structuralists were residing and so obviously there was a lot of discussion over the in the canteen as well. Uh, CLA is a tri-dimensional method, and this is basically, I think, was the, was the nub of my paper, is giving a, 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 a genealogy to CLA that traces back through Gregory Bateson's work on abduction and learning levels, uh, which he borrowed or used from or developed from Bertrand Russell and Whitehead, uh, also based on C.S. Pierce's uh, discovery or rediscovery of, of abduction, the third uh, inference model that Aristotle talked about, but he felt that it was uh, poorly translated and he, he renamed it re retroduction. 
And we can go back through a bit of a line through John Locke as well, who was mentioning in his works this need for a third aspect, but was very much uh, criticised and censored or cancelled culture in the modern terms as being crude and superficial and subversive even. So a stick with the binary induction deduction. So that's the history, and I think that's the power of it. So that's what led me to seeing how Gregory Bateson's view can give us a double description of the CLO. Bateson's double, double bind was effectively that we're uh, trying to develop uh, economically, but also uh, we need to preserve our environment. In terms of the Indian culture or the human uh, elephant conflict, there is this double bind, and very simply, we can look at a couple of them. The primary bind on the left is conserve elephants, but we want economic development. The problem, the double secondary bind is we can only use empirical sciences to discuss this. Everything else is just uh, subjective waffle. And the exit or block of exit is actually the uh, government policy funding, uh, turning it off, turning it on. And that's where that uh, rotation idea between governing the, the men churning out the, the forests into the money image came from. Uh, villager in the center with the actual reality of elephants. Uh, his folk ethic is they are also sacred gods. So elephants are sacred, they destroy crops. It's very stringent government legislation in most cases. In India, it's the federal level, but the states are the ones who actually implement it. And so there's potential potential corruption is the exit, either at the individual village level where things just happen, but also at the, at the, at the national levels where we would just call it regulatory capture. So this is obviously an area for um, uh, focus on public health uh, in terms of the stresses and strains. And there's a very high suicide rate in India in the rural areas. Uh, I won't read through this, but basically Bateson's original bubble bind was uh, quite sophisticated and was uh, focused on the, compounded, uh, the compounding effect of falsified contexts and the patterns of interpersonal communication which actually, can, which actually continued this denial that these things were being falsified. So that's, uh, I think, a deep I agree, this, this is just zero learning from using a traffic uh, metaphor. Uh, we don't learn, uh, we don't learn anything while we're driving, we hit the pothole or we miss it. Uh, if we hit the pothole too many times, we end up having to change the tires, uh, flat tires, and they, maybe we learn something there. But in the moment, it's just instinctive reaction. It's learning level one, perhaps these potholes are being reported, and for a few days, the local traffic Getting the work is blocked, and so you find a quick way around, no, no problem, we'll catch the train. At the next level, the government announces they're going to actually put a you know, freeway system in, and it's going to take six to nine months or a year, and you decide that uh, uh, you've got to find an alternative way, catch public transport, go the back roads, or actually just change your work, change our work and move to a, somewhere closer. At the next level, which is really where we are now, and happens less frequently, but the whole system just goes into a, 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 a spasmodic change and the whole nature of work changes. And suddenly we're working from home and trying to find new meaning. You know, the COVID-19 is an example. After that, it's a bit new, uh, nebulous and I've just put that as kind of in the matrix somewhere. Now my focus is on this double bind control between uh, learning three and learning uh, two. And the escape is into a better ecology of mind and technology of how to present this empirical and uh, phenomenological view and the complex math for, uh, metaphor is the one to go for, for me anyway, and show you how zero can be looked at as past, present and future line. And so from this point of view, if there's any professors in the room, then I just basically say uh, it's braiding three complementary void related paradoxical metaphors with shared mixed entitlements. And one is the mathematical zero, which descent is negative and positive numbers, and also real and imaginary numbers, and facilitates its rotation on a meta level, meta complex plane. The philosophical nothingness or nowhere, which is uh, the fundamentals of Sunna in uh, Hinduism as a form of, and Buddhism as a form of salvation, and really gives us the, the hidden but the essence of the modern zero. Uh, before that, it was just a space scratched on uh, clay in uh, Samaria. Uh, uh, in, and useful for counting sheep and nothing much else. And then in our own, in our own dimension, uh, domain, we have foresight in future that, according to gene data, doesn't actually exist, but it certainly attracts our imagination. So Bateson's view was it's the way, the, uh, it's the uh, relationship between the way 
nature works and the way our minds work, and there needs to be a necessary unity. And of course, this is where I would then go quickly with the complex uh, number metaphor, not the maths and science. So, very quickly, uh, Roberto Mascherano, who came up with Francis Ferrella, the, uh, uh, the term autopoiesis, he's a professor of biology, used the eye, and also Double Bateson used uh, the eye and the, the two images that come through the eyes uh, that create depth. And if you remember the, uh, the 3D glasses that we wear for, for maps and uh, films, that's where that comes from. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'm just going to go through. Uh, the CLA also has an inner and outer dimension relationship. So here I've just looked at the external world as the futures triangle, push, pull and wait, and use the Indian philosophy of three, three gunas or three qualities that merge together. Uh, and these can be sort of braided into, I think, a, a, an interesting approach. Uh, very quickly, just the, uh, the color coding is the, the blue is the push, pull and wait. And then we can add using the color coding on the top left, um, the Satharajas and Thomas energies. I won't go into them because it's, it's look at that later. But these effectively also map the same as the binary yin and yang uh, that's famous from the Chinese perspective. And you can see this color coding uh, actually marries into the process of grief, which is uh, Ellen, um, Elizabeth Kluber Ross's approach, which we move too quickly. So very quickly, there's, there is actually science behind this, and it's used in advertising every time we walk down the, uh, the shrine walls, the aisles. Uh, the additive approach is, is on the stage, which is where uh, the three light sources, red, blue, and green, the primaries, are added together, and the spotlight becomes the luminous energy of three in the centre. Um, when it comes to the passive or the subtractive approach, where we start with white paper, our printers use the, the merged um, and magenta, cyan, and yellow, and basically uh, retract colors or subtract colors until there's a black center. And that's how the system works. This actually, I think, uh, equates to a double description. Uh, it's based on a color wheel, so there is a science behind it. Now, very quickly, I just, uh, we can look at this as uh, down the left side, we've got the triangles, uh, the futures triangle, push, pull, and wait, and across the top, the uh, the Safe, Rad, Just, and Tamas squares. And we can see just by making it a three by three, uh, nine squares, that there is a sense of integration and, and disintegration between the top left and the bottom right. If we fold across this diagonal, we can see that there are some synergies or linkages that might be used as an index. You know, for instance, the yellow, um, the cyan, and the magenta. And I won't go into details, but if we join these up, we can see that depression and resignation and grief might link up with medical technologies, resources and thanatal services, burial services, if you want. Uh, we also need in a, a targeted communication system to look at the cultures. Um, there are basically recognised uh, three, guilt, shame and fear on the spectrum. And obviously in India, uh, we can look at pride as one, but uh, when, when we get a, a very complicated mix, then it's more, it's more difficult to understand what's actually going to grow out. And so, so what I guess the point here is if, if strategies are formulated in, in the Western ethic, they may not work very well in, in other cultures. Um, a quick but on zero, um, it's a point of view of emptiness. It's totally fresh. It has no bias. It simply is. It's a ultimate reference point for the scientific objectivity, the scientific point of view. And basically without this point, uh, some sort of reference point we get this uh, confusion follows this postmodernism and absence of reference point. Perhaps the distancing and making remarkable within the post structural approach uh, that Sahel uses is this, in fact, same, same uh, principle that we implemented. So, total risk communication was uh, brought out in the 1990s by Peter Sandman. Um, I had an experience of being uh, through a course of this uh, at the time I was in a department that was looking at mining regulation and various, there were quite a few incidents and deaths and the engineers were just looking at the technicals and uh, it was felt that they should be aware of the subjective realm, the political outrage, if you like. And this is a model that's also used in banking for country risk analysis and effectively it's systemic risk plus unsystemic risk. We see the pattern, it's empirical plus subjective. 
Um, and John Simpson, I actually, he was a lecturer at Curtin University. That's where I picked up that idea. And then Piers Locke, who did a lot of work in the elephant uh, research, uh, with, it, with his term ethno-elephantology. And I think that just sort of provides a convenient framework if we look at it as elephant countries. Then this is what I'm going. This is what allows us to introduce the uh, this critical element, uh, pragmatic critical element, into Eleanor Ostrom's uh, social ecological systems model. So very quickly, just on to Kuba Ross, uh, not to go in deep, but it's a five stage model uh, that was has some uh, debate in literature, but it was really developed for the person who was dying, the person who got uh, who had uh, cancer and. That was their end process. Uh, her co-worker, David Kessler, came out not too many years ago with a finding the six-stage aimed at the, those left behind dealing with the trauma. And I can look at, or we can look at the meaning, uh, this uh, six-stage from Bates' point of view as that sort of trito meaning. And effectively, Foucault comes in right on this point as well, I think, uh, that it's the tactics of domination is the essence of power, and it's the expression of the will to dominate through even controlling the options or choices, which is exactly what this uh, uh, control of level three is all about. Uh, very quickly, just as a, as, as a simple case study to uh, uh, show how it might be useful for, for changing your thinking, um, in 1554, and so this is really the 360-year uh, death cycle of a paradigm I'm uh, putting forward here. So in 1554, a mathematician in Italy put a shock surprise in a, com in a computation uh, with something called the square root of minus one. It's paradoxical. It didn't exist. No one knew what to do with it. He ignored it pretty much. Uh, Descartes ignored it and, and gave it the term imaginary numbers as a derogatory term, which in a sense probably caused the 360-year, contributed to the 360-year uh, delay. Uh, Isaac Newton basically uh, pretty much ignored it as well. But there was a bit of catharsis around 1806 with uh, Argand, who was a uh, Swiss clock uh, maker, an amateur mathematician, and uh, we'll go into that in a, bit, in a minute. Uh, and then Kors, um came up with this observation, and these are, these are his words, that if they had been called direct, inverse and lateral units instead of positive, negative and imaginary, then this obscurity would have been out of the question. And maybe our great grandmothers would have been going shopping on hoverboards in the back to future kind of mode. Um, very quickly, this is not a math lesson, but I just want to uh, tap into that vortex thing. Uh, uh, Robert Kaplan came up with if you look at zero, you see nothing, but if you look through it, you'll see the organic sprawl of mathematics and through that, the complex nature of things. And that was the key for my thinking about how to move forward. Uh, Norbert Weiner, who was the father of cybernetics, and a mathematician uh, came up with the, uh, made the statement that basically um, mathematics is also a colossal metaphor and can be judged aesthetic or should be judged aesthetically as well as intellectual. Well, obviously the, the uh, science and engineering have taken the intellectual route, but it's there's open I think uh, open opportunities for the aesthetic approach. Now, very quickly, I, this is not a math lesson, but uh, once zero was invented or adopted in Europe, then in, the way of understanding it was multiplying a number by a negative, like neg a three to negative three is actually a 180 degree rotation, a mirror image. Um, the clockmaker working came up with the view that uh, if imaginary numbers actually are half, and this is the trick here, I'll just show you, um, then it must be 90 degrees. And that's where it came up with the X-Y axis representation. This was the, one of the major breakthroughs. And they put on a, an eye there as a uh, sort of, if we did it today, we'd just put a, a smiley face to say that there's a difference between X and Y in terms of qualities. Um, the key point is that two, two square roots of the minus one actually, uh, of minus one actually produce minus one. And so in a sense, it shifts from this intermediate liminal axis back onto the real number plane. What the mathematicians did was just package it up put the whole thing in a, a wrapped up a potato basically, and just used a, a complex formula, X plus Y with a smiley face. Um, basically, this is what Coca-Cola does. It puts something in a package and puts zero on there. It's zero poison, if you like, or zero sugar. 
We can uh, look at maybe just shifting this to the future. This is a, a mental exercise, but it's what would happen if there wasn't a, uh, a better level of metaphor, what I call metaphor engineering. In other words, uh, trying to find better ways of, of describing what's actually emerging now, such that it doesn't cause this uh, emotional, uh, in a sense, false rationalism. Very quickly, this just puts us in the uh, in the C category, which I would call uh, the Newtonian space or stage, and moving towards the D stage, which is just, I, I think, towards the end of the century, which I'm labelling just as post-elephant, because if nothing happens, I think there'll be an extinction event for the Asian elephant. Uh, we can also shift 25 years for quantum mechanics, which used the I for the rotation element in its formula. Uh, and then basically that's just repeating what I've uh, that same principle. So we're moving that uh, For whom the bell tolls, this is a very quick uh, uh, summary, moving towards a summary. The push of the present uh, is really uh, a, a carriage on the front of the train with the futurist out front looking for the weak signals. We can reverse this if we like and look at it as a uh, uh, carriage at the back. And it's the pull of the features. I couldn't find a way of putting the train there, so just imagine the trains on the side. But this is an area looking at retroduction and corruption from a uh, another triangle approach, which is called the Ford Triangle from uh, Donald Cressy. And this is used in crime and uh, opportunity and also in, uh, in complexity theory. This is the retroduction and abduction approach. Frequently, uh, a metal level of anticipatory grief um, can be looked at. By uh, a map came out uh, from France Telecom. I shifted the axes around so that it looked like the uh, x and y axis of a complex number, uh, angling di angling diagram. And then we can see that this these stages A, B, C, and D through to Z, if you like. But this is where the sixth uh, meaning comes in. What does this mean? Well, we can look at it maybe as the pursuit of happiness. It's eudematic. Um, and this is not new. It's embedded in the uh, pursuit of happiness in the American Constitution. And it's also in uh, countries like Bhutan have a gross national happiness index. Um, part of the way of how we deal with time, and this is, the, this is part of a complex problem, is that there are three. Kronos is the, the, the birth to death linear time approach, year to year end. Uh, Aeon is the... Uh, God of cycles and seasons, and perhaps the business cycle as well, which I guess uh, fits into the idea of re recursion and reincarnation in the Indian ethic. And then there's Keros, which is the Greek god of opportunity, uh, followed closely behind by metanoia, uh, which is grief and remorse. Uh, you'll note that the forelock is out there at the front, and this was uh, symbolizing that it's the opportunity to, to grab him by the forelock and seize the opportunity or seize the moment. And if you miss it, then it's grief. If you think this is history, then here's an image that's used in current political debate. Whether it's deliberate, I suspect it's probably uh, tapping very, very much into the subliminal messaging going on. The grand tour summary is that the CLA Bates model provides a useful detailed data description. The uh, complex metaphor increases transparency and, and demystification, which opens doors. The total risk communication model provides a pragmatic theory base. Uh, based on complex, uh, sorry, theory based for complex human elephant conflict. And the SES with critical futures elements can help transform uh, research and policy approaches. And the CLA offers targeted and transformation knowledge and, and techniques and opportunities for disciplines using the CS. What's in it for the future? Well, very quickly, I just think there's an expanded toolkit option, uh, which some call uh, requisite complexity. It actually is uh, Ross Ashby's uh, requisite variety. Uh, greater clarity of distinctions between the complex metaphor uh, as, as used in mathematics, which is the fulcrum between humanities and science, and this term complexity, which is commonly used, but uh, has no specific, specific definition. It's universally accepted. Um, this, this produces less fear and anxiety in, in, a, in the approach. It's better rationale for braiding empirical and subjective data within a total risk in, uh, context. And this helps with uh, SES foresight, targeted and transform, transformational knowledge development. And I believe has 
uh, good good potential within industries such as fishery, forestry, agriculture uh, for consulting, if this can be understood. And uh, basically means that policy uh, and management uh, services can be uh, approached and, and engaged with from a critical futures perspective, uh, valuable or more small value uh, via this uh, marriage. And there's a local literacy in the South and Southeast Asian uh, market in itself. So very quickly, just visiting back, we have this link between the fashions and the, uh, the overall uh, ethic uh, um, myth. We have the um, human, the, the disciplines involved. We have a sense of critical time, and we have the sense of opportunity and remorse if we miss it. And there is some way out through our own, what Gregory Bateson called the ecology of mind. In other words, our own technology of thinking, which is in mathematics. But once we open our eyes to this and start to see it, we see the patterns even in, a, in architecture. Uh, here's an image of, of a future that India is now starting to move towards, which effectively is this natural overpass of the real economy and zero gaps that do connect it in, 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 a, in a paradoxical way. So very quickly, I won't tell on this, but science is uh, between, uh, sorry, maths is between humanities and science. Some argue it is actually humanities. They bind them together. Uh, we can see that there's recognition at the elite uh, mathematical level, but there's problems in how to communicate this and promote this within the uh, student learning domain. And I think that's key. What we need is, is more scientists with the ability to see it this way. As a comment. We notice that the, uh, the German view in the tower is one face actually has the science and engineering, that's the clock, and the other has the, the princess of humanities uh, lowering down the braided hair for the uh, people to climb, I suppose, the commons. Back to Peter Drucker, it's about asking questions in the future, and, the, and, the, and then it's the engineering. How do, how do we have leaders uh, to actually ask the difficult questions so that we're not just doing things right, but we're doing the right things. Um, here's an example of the elephant in the room, the boardroom, the staff room, as you wish. Of course, it's using the Western ethic where the elephant is the focus and the problem, uh, not the lack of uh, um, some sort of uh, coordinating, coordinating principle in there. So we can look at approaching this through a, a, the paradox of a don't think of elephants approach, but also if we just think of a, of a bundle of keys, there is a, a blank and there's a hole, a hole in each one of them through which a common ring can be used. Life without zero, well, uh, Albert, uh, Alfred Whitehead made a slight category error here. It's true, no one goes out to buy zero fish, but in the modern context, people do go out to buy uh, something, a container uh, with zero poison or zero something in it, maybe it's gluten. Uh, back to rebalancing what we need if we use a fulcrum, and I'm using those red, blue, and green uh, Brunner uh, colours. Uh, using the elephants as a, as a grounded fulcrum, we can see that the energy at the moment has been in the science and engineering area. That comes down to money and, and, and privilege. This should be reversed to some extent, such that uh, we still keep going, but in fact, the humanities are, are beefed up and we get people at the leadership levels, but people I think just distributed throughout society that have the ability to ask and address complex, complex issues and complex questions, or at least not be fearful of complex as a sort of foreign metaphor, which is simply as the way the world works um, and we're in a better position. So this is the flipping rotation, and I think this is the, the technology we need uh, to find the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Uh, very quickly, and this was a slip in slide, so I won't, I won't go through this, but very simply, the, the nature of our zero uh, came from uh, two directions. One was the Babylonian number, which was two dashes or, or spaces in the uh, clay. But, and effectively, it was just about counting sheep, actual property. Now, the other side is the Indian contribution, which is about non-things, it's about zero, it's about time, it's about sunya, and this is the future space. And uh, we have, if we look at the, the ancient Greek uh, three uh, trinary models of time, we have an object, we have a new window into it. So the Mayans actually used zero. Uh, in computing, zero is used as the first index. And we note that Gregory Bateson used zero. And, and what they did, uh, the Western calendar was invented in the Roman Empire times, and they didn't have zero then. 
And so basically, the Mayans actually just put zero in as a sort of a meta system. So the first day of a month is actually the installation of seating of SIP, SIP is a Mayan month, and then follows on from there. So they had no problem with deciding which was the first, uh, the first year in, in the new millennium, 2000 or 2001, whereas it's uh, that's a So there's an, up, there's an update culture aspect to the Western view of time based uh, knowledge. Just very quickly, um, this paper and approach is, is going to be included in the new CLA forthcoming CLA3 book. So thank you to the people for that. And uh, I just, uh, people should talk to uh, Dr. John Sweeney about what that involves. And uh, so hopefully you've enjoyed these uh, postcards from the boundary, from boundary research. And there's something about the uh, going to see the elephant, which was an old uh, American ethic of the journey westward. And it hasn't been too disappointing. Well, thank you very much. Questions? Hello, Russell. Thank you very much for your presentation okay. and everything. Mm -hmm. I have a few behind the scenes questions mm -hmm. about your PhD process. So the first okay. question is, when you did your proposal and you had to convince the university people that this was a good study, um, I would like to hear a word or two about um, were, were they open, um, was it easy, are there enough in the review panel, enough people with futures studies, cleverness in their heads so that when you come with a futures studies kind of proposal, they understand what you are proposing and are able to, re, to measure it with future studies rulers and not try to apply other rulers to future studies kind of proposals. And more or less the same question for your, for your, def, for your defense in the end, for your PhD defense. And then um, in, along that same line, um, I see, if we look at recent years of student awards, it seems as though the University of Southern Queensland is actually quite successful in producing um, award-winning PhDs. So a little bit about their PhD program, if you could, and then about your research itself. Did you involve people anywhere along the way? Did you do interviews, focus groups, anything? Or was this just because it's a very impressive study, um, but through your presentation, I couldn't hear anything about people being involved in any way. Okay. So there are four questions. Oh, I look over one question person. <laughs> okay, let me try and address this. Um, in the beginning, uh, I presented uh, a report uh, after the first year, and it's the Sunshine Coast University in Queensland, which I think is the last university in Australia that has a futures program. And it's really anchored in there by, at the time it was Sahail as a, uh, an adjunct professor, Sahail in Tula, uh, but he's since uh, left, and uh, Dr. Marcus Bussey. And uh, currently it's still Marcus, Dr. Um, Marcus is still there. Um, so there's that little kernel. There was some uh, university, I think, in in Melbourne and a couple of others, but they seem to have just uh, faded off. I think this is just the, uh, and even back in the year 2000, I did my master's, Curtin University in Perth had a futures program, but, you know, it just doesn't compete with the business administration degree. <laughs> and, uh, so um, there's, there's, a, there's a small number of people. Uh, I got a good reviewer who went through my, my proposal. Um, I won't mention names, but he, he ticked it off and said it looked pretty good. Um, I obviously didn't quite have all this uh, Eleanor Ostrom kind of stuff, but I had a sense of it, but I just quite, I, you know, it's been later in the program that I found actually where I can make it empirical and pragmatic. So uh, I presented it um, via Zoom, I think. Yeah, it was via Zoom, uh, February 2020. So this was the crazy COVID beginning. <laughs> um and then uh, I won't go into personal details, but then I was diagnosed with a uh, <laughs> six months. Uh, I wouldn't be around if the cancer wasn't knocked on the head. And this was a complete surprise to me. Uh, I won't go. It actually worked well, but the chemo worked. So 2020 was a complete write-off. I just took, took the time off. Um, so that gives me a bit of an insight as to what uh, Cooper Ross was talking about, <laughs> uh, although I, had, I sort of had it in the background. Um, 
So that was the first question. Uh, so there are people and uh, in that university with Marcus and a few others, so there's a dozen or so. And I guess Zoom means that they don't all have to be in the one physical place. Uh, what was the second part? Sorry, the, uh, the dissertation defence. Well, I suppose I'm practising it now. So it's obviously got to be a bit shorter and sharper than what I've done here. But uh, uh, the APF said I had an hour and a half to fill in, so I, I sort of stretched it out a bit. Um, on the presentation night, I did all, I sort of gave a five or ten, five or eight minute presentation, so it's good exercise for me to do that. Can you refresh me as to what the other point was? The, um, that's the beginning I of the end. I wanted to know whether there was people involved in your study, and then I apologise if I got the university name wrong. Um, yeah, there's the there's University say, of South Queensland. I'm in Western Australia, so it's a foreign country for me as well. So, uh, you know, but Marcus is there and it's the Sunshine, uh, the University of Sunshine Coast, which is a, a region south of Brisbane. It's, it's a sort of a regional university. Um, but it's good enough for the Australian uh, university system and the, the government pays for it here. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't interview anyone. Uh, I retired, and I kind of thought, ah, oh, yeah. And I know people. It's the typical way. But it was. It was partly the attraction of Sahel's approach of critical discourse analysis. In other words, uh, the data's there. People have written about it, and really, we just start off with that as the data, and then interpret it through the CLA approach. So it's a lazy approach, but I think it's. It's a smart approach as well. It just suited me. Um, otherwise, I would have to go into the field and interview people. And, and at the end of the day, I thought, well, there's lots of experts. And they've written stuff. <laughs> what I've got to do in my job to add value, to add sort of something to, to uh, this is my inner story, I suppose, to add something to, to claim a PhD status is find a way of bolting these uh, seemingly incommensurate aspects together. And that's why uh, I didn't want to go into mathematics. Uh, you know, complex numbers always, always intrigued me. So I'm not interested in the science of it. You know, engineers use it for fluid dynamics and field analysis. Uh, Einstein used it. I didn't point that out. But his whole thing was based on his teacher, Mikulski, uh, used the time and space for, for space time. And that really blew Einstein's uh, paradigm away. So that's what I, I thought. Yeah, there's a doorway here. It's, it's low-hanging fruit. And what's, what's a deficit in the futures area, and I think this came out in a paper a couple of years ago, Fukunandi um, and uh, a couple of others talked about the sort of resistance to science within futures. Well, I don't know whether that's true or not, but there's certainly a, a, an opportunity to understand mathematics from an aesthetic perspective. In other words, how did they, what, what tricks did they use to package it up as metaphors that could then be manipulated and digested? And I just thought, Bingo, why aren't we teaching this? You know, it's mathematics for 19th century clerks, you know, in the British Empire, where I am. Um, I, I would have loved to have known about sort of um, Pythagoras as a sort of a, a secret cult. <laughs> you know, all, all the, all, you know, even Isaac Newton was a, was a rabid um, uh, um, alchemist. You know, and then those papers have been hidden for two or three hundred years. It's been published now. And so... You know, this is sort of shame and, oh, it's got to be rigid science. Well, this is what Bateson was trying to talk about. We're just, we're missing, we're trying to do one hand clapping. I mean, it's not to say that alchemy, I just used the the, the, uh, the Isaac Newton. Thing. It's not to say that alchemy is, is, is really something serious. It's to say that Isaac Newton as a person had to involve his imaginary side to be able to find that particular genius, excuse me, that genius, and then communicate at least half of it into the what we call empirical sciences and disciplines. And so I think unless we move back and understand that behind the curtains, it's the human nature to have the left and right side of the brain, the two types of thinking married together and working, not merged and just you know, grey plasticine, but in some way the technology that respects the difference right and left side brain, but also works it together as one. Uh, look, there's a whole lot of stuff there. Um, uh, Stephen McGilchrist is, is a great one to look at for that in terms of he called, his book came out to us, the, uh, the Master and the Emerson. And it says it's actually the right brain, uh, the, we call it the hemisphere. In actual fact, biologically, it's two brains. We have two eyes, we don't say it's two, two half eyes. And I was interested in this area uh, in the vagal system that goes down into the gut brain. Uh, so I'm looking at it from a system that the supervisor just said too much. 
<laughs> but that's what I'm saying is it's a balance and finding you know, grounded in our biology is actually running to, you know, one hand washes the other. It's, it's not a, a shame or a thing. So if we do that, then I think our, our, our capacities to uh, emerge new ideas and new meaning, the Gregory Bates and depth from a double description, just ought to be basic 101 literacy, particularly in our discipline. That's it. So... No, I didn't interview people. I, I took the sneaky way around. <laughs> if I do it properly, it'll work. If I don't, yeah, it's a fail. Um, I think I found the key. This sort of came to me actually part, partly bringing it all together over Christmas for this type of talk. And the other part was, well, the dissertation defence, I guess, will just have to be you know, the same club of people and does it hang together or not? And I, what I'll present differently or what, what I'll present at the end of the year, if all goes well, is a couple more papers focused on a couple of areas. Uh, journals have a difficulty with all this stuff, so I've got to chop it up in different ways. Um, but uh, really the focus will be much more uh, the pragmatic use and utility of this, so the agency it develops using Eleanor Ostrom's model and up, updating it, because that just that just open do opens doors and has has communication engagement with the econom the economists of the world you know, <laughs> and other disciplines. So it's really sort of it's really working from that zero ethic, finding the distance, finding the space, and putting something there that actually paradoxically isn't there but allows everyone to start talking across it. This, this was the original intent of cybernetics, and uh, Margaret Mead is a good quote from her, you know, talking about it's just, it's just a communication device, and that's where Gregory Bateson was coming from. So it's not, it's not cybernetics, the computer system running the world. It's cybernetics as a, as a communication across disciplines, interdisciplinary communication system. Communication system. So it's, none of this is new. It's just playing the language uh, I came out of a systems and cybernetics area. I was in IT for many years. Uh, but they're in that space where it's just more systems. Now, the answer is just more systems. <laughs> Can't these people understand the logic and the rationale behind it? Well, Norbert Weiner and people at the elite mathematics levels know, know that it's actually a science of metaphors. It's actually communicating with people. And I'm hoping to use that total risk, uh, which, which policy, policy experts can't ignore. It's, it, there is a rigid, it's pragmatic there. So you can go, here's the, here's the science, here's the engineering aspect, here's the, the elements that are at risk. And then on the other side, here's the outrage, here's the political, here's the subjective view. And in that uh, uh, fraud audit triangle is an interesting one because they use that in banking risk, uh, management risk analysis. And the, the capacity to rationalize is actually the auditor's personal subjective opinion about the individual in focus, their capacity to rationalise a way of crime. In other words, it's the bank manager, access to money, with a gambling habit, the need, and then the inner dialogue that says, I missed that promotion, These, they owe me something, and off they go. So to actually look at auditing, and I think auditing is part of the feedback loop in the cybernetics sense, look at that, we actually need to look at how we can audit better. So uh, trucker said, uh, um, the question about leadership asking better questions, you know, how to pin them down with sophisticated, uh, don't run away from complex. That's what I'm trying to say is actually embrace it and use it as a, as a, a judo kind of technique. But then how do we actually communicate through and guide people in their own you know, engineering worlds and, 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 and environment science worlds? So at the end of that, it's a communication exercise. Futures can lead in this. I think it's just a space where this strange com combo can be talked about and discussed. But out on the field, uh, you know, I would, and I pitch this to the, you know, professional futurists. Uh, I, I'm not in that space, but um, there's a lot of money floating around in fisheries and agriculture and these sort of spaces, research money. So a futurist, rather than going there saying, you know, I'm at the front of the train and I can talk about, <laughs> you know, weak signals, which is fine. That's no problem. Um, that's good stuff. But, you know, I'm actually, I can actually come in here and show you how to do targeted knowledge and develop sort of transformational knowledge using something like the CLA. So it's, it's not magic. It's in the bag of tricks. And here you go. And by the time you've left this little, little loop, uh, you'll be better uh, economists or better uh, 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 environmental scientists because you'll be able to ask the tough questions and, and, and frame it differently. You know, so it's not sort of getting in there, it's complementary, I think that's what I'm trying to say. And if that's the case, then there's a lot of research money uh, potential coming out of those, what we would now say are just 
standard empirical science disciplines, but they're missing something. And uh, you know, to go in there and say, oh, I'm from the arts department, what you need is more, is more this, is, is not quite the strategy I'm talking about. It's to go in there and say, actually, look at it this way, and we can add this, and using that sort of Peter Sandman, total risk is this plus this, and I'm looking at the outrage factor uh, tailored to India, tailored to the Hindu Buddhist ethic. It's a big market. How do you want to play it? You know, here's my contribution. Here's the invoice. <laughs> so you know, I just think it's that you know it can be pitched at that level. I think, but behind it, obviously, I've gone here into this sort of turtles all the way down approach because uh, then I can feel comfortable and confident. And like I said, this is actually quite a, a recent uh, until there's been a bit of a faith based <laughs> uh, PhD approach. I just I, I instinctively knew that there was an answer, but I didn't know quite how to grasp all the, all the spokes and bring them together into a central nothing uh, axis, you know, like a bike. You know, bike really. And then that came through in the last, you know, couple of, couple of months, I think. And uh, having to do this presentation for APF actually forced me to, to start putting the things together. So I thought, well, why not? I'm practising for the end. So it'll be much more focused on uh, the Ostrom aspect of it and the pragmatic use of it, uh, fitting into layer two of the CLA. And you know, how do how do these? And in my la, uh, last decade at work in employment, I was uh, actually in the policies uh, planning sort of area, and was considered an expert at the time on key performance indicators, uh, output based management, and that sort of stuff. Um, so really, the answer is how to craft uh, almost like a programming. You know, how to craft the right indicators, the right policy levers that can be implemented. And if that's the case, then the money, the money box is opened and the government processes can, as mechanical as they are, can proceed on a better track than the one they're going on now. And everyone's recognising that. They just don't know quite how to go. And somehow the arts department just doesn't seem to be credible. Well, I think futures pitched on this kind of, uh, yeah, there's a pragmatic sphere and there's a science or at least a, a wisdom behind what we're doing uh, is, uh, has great utility and gives you greater agency in your particular consulting role. That's how I'm seeing it. Um, so that will be my defence at the end, <laughs> that all this all this crazy turtles all the way down actually delivers on the road in terms of uh, better science, uh, better scientists, more, more awareness of how to, the nuances of the culture and the opportunities of targeted and uh, transformational knowledge. Which I think comes out of Sahail's work. I just don't know. Maybe others have other ways as well, but for me, it was Sahail's CLA approach that kind of nailed it down. So I've just explored that. So hopefully, that's fingers crossed going to be the end. Does that answer your, your, your question? Yes, Sorry. it does. Um, in some or another manner, I don't know why I, I made the assumption. I thought your PhD was done and that you just wrote the article based on the PhD, you know, that the PhD and the defense and everything. But if I hear you correctly now, you're still in the process. You're going to... Oh, yeah, it's, it's by publication. So I have to produce... I actually asked what is the working title of your research project. So in that regard, I want to ask about the structure of your PhD. Um, do you write articles and then do some or another wraparound, or do yeah, you write yeah. one big thesis but with spin-off articles from it? Uh, no, I'm doing it by publication. Uh, the overall arching was the opening slide on the presentation, the transformation. I actually had initially just put the understanding of it, uh, but the reviewer came, the reviewers came back on my uh, uh candidacy proposal and said, it's transformation. <laughs> that was get in there and roll your sleeves up. Uh, it took me a while to understand the subtle differences. But yeah, uh, so I'm looking at the transformation of the relationship between humans and, and, and look, it's wildlife conflict, really. But elephants in the Asian context, ha uh, uh, you know, uh, just have a sort of more symbolic meaning than a rhinoceros or, something, or a tiger. You know, I mean, it's just it's the same equation. But if elephants, the Asian elephants, do go extinct, and I mean, it's there's not that many left, and as species do die, then suddenly there's something in the gene pool that fades away, and a virus attack, and they're gone. You know, it happens very quickly. And I think the, one of the uh, mammoths or whatever, the, I think the last herd were up in the top of an island on Russia, and they got down to about 300 animals, and after that, there's just not enough diversity. The end's there. So you know, we might think, oh, 50 animals, you know, 50,000 animals. Uh, but that could very quickly whittle down, you know, particularly with 
other issues and stress. So, um, and, they, and they take about, uh, the, the, the pregnancies are about two years, uh, it's about three or four years. So it's about a six year cycle between each elephant, you know, in terms of, and they live to about 70 or 80 years old, like we do. Uh, but in captivity, they're half that. They, you know, they'll die off with the stresses in zoos. So uh, it's by publication. I mean, I probably now actually would rather just write the thing out because I think I've got it. <laughs> but um, uh, the, the contract is to produce some papers. So the Bates and paper was the first genuine paper. And like I said, I had that 2020 was a bit of a weird year for me. I just took time off. And uh, some of this, I, last year I tried to get a couple of papers together, but the journals just want the one thing, you know, just, and for some reason, either my tech, uh, my, my sort of uh, competency levels, but I just tend to be, now uh, there's three things at least, you know, let's weave them together. But, you know, this is, I think now that I've got, I now I've got a better angle on it, I'll, I'll chop the elephant down into the, uh, the six postcards and, and go for journals on that basis. So it's no blame on journals. It's just this is part of the communication. But it was all. It felt like it was the heart was dying before, uh, and I hadn't quite got that alchemy as to how it actually all kind of magically hangs together. So that was the Christmas kind of illumination. I thought, got it. Now I can do the papers on. You know, one will be on a maths angle, one will be on something else. But they'll all come together. So I, I basically have to produce about five or six papers. Uh, the next one's on on Ostrom sort of area, trying to find a way of, of focusing on that. After that, it's 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 more about the double baits and stubble bind as a kind of a community, not not focused in, but as a general thing. And then I really what I'm talking about the maths in here, the zero thing was actually the last paper. It was sort of thinking about how I rationalise it all up. So I've, I've, it's, it's, it, for some reason last year it just stuck in the, it wouldn't go away. So. The last paper will be this polishing off approach as to the maths behind it. And then I just have to do a, is it called an exegesis or something, a summary across and tie it all together and present it and then defend it. So that'll be, I think it's crossed the end of that December or early next year. So I'm a year oh, behind where I want it to be. So that's, that's it too. So that. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you for all of that sharing, Russell. That was very valuable. Um, I'm also hoping to, to finish my PhD towards the end of the year. And I had the same problem of um, 2020 and 21 being in treatment. I am literally due on Monday for final scans, and then hopefully I'm out of treatment for a while. Yeah, oh, well, well done. Yeah, look, it hit me. In fact, I, 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 it was a mass who just sort of said, what's this little lump? I didn't even know about it. And uh, it was, it was uh, about a week before I did my presentation for the candidacy, you know, and I thought, oh, yeah. Uh, about three days later, <laughs> it came I back. The same. I, I did my, I did my yeah. proposal, got diagnosed, and then, well, my treatment just lasted. It's it's still ongoing. Hopefully, towards the end oh, of okay. it, we'll be done for, for with my, most of the treatment. But it was literally two, two years of treatment and trying to keep the the work balls in the, in the air. Um, uh, the PhD just got shoved yeah, to the back yeah. burner for a long time. Yeah, I completely understand. Look, I had, to, I just uh, because I've retired, I just basically stopped everything and rested. And so, look, it was an aggressive lymphoma. And uh, you know, uh, three days after the presentation, uh, I got the diagnosis back, and it's like, uh, yeah, come in and talk to us. Um, and I went straight in, and uh, the, the hospitals were all shutting down with the COVID business. <laughs> uh, but by Easter, it was the size of a, a, a boiled egg, basically. And the specialist said, if you hadn't caught this straight away, uh, you'd be dead by Christmas. Uh, simple as that. So luckily, I did four rounds of chemo, four or five rounds of chemo, and then some radiation at the end of it. And fingers crossed, it's been knocked out. So great medical technology, uh, you know, great doctors. Um, so yeah, that was my experience during the, the 20s, the 2020s. Um, so it was only in early 2021 that I came back into this uh, area and tried to, and that's where this mathematical thing just, you know, still somewhat probably dazed by the chemo, <laughs> all, all, all the drugs and things. But um, I just thought, well, if the math thing won't go away, I'll just do it. You know, so really, I've done the last paper now, but it's worked out. I've I've solved the the inner algorithm, the, the sort of the inner alchemy of it. And now I feel much more confident about how to just to target the journals and spin out bits of papers. And, you know. 
on one bottom line theme. To me, it's well, disappointing, if, but if it's the way the, the system works. If you look video of yours in the beginning, what comes first and what comes later becomes a very interesting thing. So the mere fact that the the, the paper that you thought would be last is now first of yeah. if you, if you in, in It's not that linear. Kind of and it, and in effect, it's like... It's like Stephen Covey's, uh, you know, seven habits. You know, you begin with the end in mind. So, you know, it's it's not new logic. It's just like how does it apply in your own personal circumstances and can hang in there. So yeah, it's, it's it's maintaining good health. Uh, obviously, the PhD for me means I sit at a computer <laughs> and I have weight problems and all those sort of other issues that, that are around. But look, it's just it's a um, End, end of life kind of hobby, not a hobby, but what I wanted to do, uh, a, a PhD in a, in a philosophical sense, and, and futures is is the way it has the, the space to be able to play around in, in that area. So hopefully so I've contributed enough to get a to say, Russell, is your degree going to say PhD in futures studies, or is it, do you call it, do they call it something else? I, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, oh, but just take I, it. If they give you the red robe, take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, look, I, I, whatever whatever the system does to work, I just sort of, it's a personal, you know, it's like, yes, I can do it kind of thing, you know, the, 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 the delinquent student all the way through my early years, you know, I'm going to prove I can actually do it. But um, So I don't know. I, when I did my master's, which is where I sort of, uh, woke up to this this whole area in around 2000. I was still working and I was doing it part time. It was half uh, half lecturing and half uh, research thesis. Um, the the uh, I forgot where I was going to go with that, but the uh, it was a Curtin University in Perth had coined it as a Masters of Future Studies. But when I they changed it to that, following the trends. Uh, but when I actually started, it was a Masters of Arts. In future studies, and to be honest, that's really what I wanted. You know, a bachelor's of degree in business, which was I. I, I worked in IT industry since the seventies, you know, punch cards and data processing. Um, so it was a bachelor of business, a master's of arts, and a doctor's of philosophy when I, <laughs> when I was about seventy. So you know, I'm sort of following. So be careful what you promise yourself when you're 19 years old. But uh, yeah, I probably should have done it much earlier. But you know, and family and other things. So it's just like we've been. Yeah, so that's so you're from South Africa. I guess I'm hearing the accent, but uh, and yes, your PhD. I PhDs. live in Cape Town. I work at the University of Stellenbosch Business School, where I lecture in future studies. Um, but I also okay. head up our Institute for Futures Research. So I do the commercial work as well, and um, so I have the best of both worlds. I work in practice, uh, so I try to practice what I preach in class. Um, so I teach on the academic Excellent. programs, and then I, I head up the commercial unit where we engage with, with commercial clients. Okay. Well, I have a friend and colleague over there, uh, you know, John Clark, who's uh, involved in sort of fighting some West Australian renegade mining company. Um, but also Margaret, uh, uh, is a, uh, young, a young Mar lady. Margaret Niemann. Yeah, um, Margaret van Weyck. Oh, that's the an anthropologist that studied. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's yeah. a sorry. Sorry, She's apologies. She's one of our Margaret. most recent graduates. Yeah. Um, well, she, look. To be honest, last year I she does, and she's an artist as well. She's an artist, mm -hmm. a graphic artist. She studied anthropology and she did future studies. And she is putting the most beautiful and the the mind of that young girl. She, uh, she's still going to do amazing things. You, you yeah. Well, I'll just be cheering her on all the way. Okay. Well, the story there is, is uh, I did I did propose a paper to uh, Rail Miller's, uh, which was I think running out of your university. Their uh, uh, anticipation uh, South or something it was one of their uh, UNESCO projects. So I submitted a paper. It got rejected, but uh, the reviewer said, "Ah." Oh, Talk to this young lady called Marguerite and maybe do a paper together. So you know, I said, well, actually, we know we end up knowing John Clark as a common friend. Uh, so she and I sort of got down to try and do a paper, but it, it just didn't work out. You know, we couldn't find the common. But she was she uh, she's um, who's the singer, the rock and roll star, the uh, yeah, Johnny Clegg. 
Tony Clegg, yeah. So we got all into that and Thanatos and all the rest. And so, look, there's a lot of potential there. But I just couldn't find at the time. This was sort of October, November. November. So we had a lot of fun and then we just pulled the plug on it. But that's another one of those um, uh, journals that want something, but <laughs> they don't want the elephant. They just want the Volkswagen. <laughs> so there you go. But yeah, so I'm sure Margaret will come up with a lot of good stuff. You know, there's a lot in that. And, and I actually got quite interested in the Zulu worldviews and what was going on there, uh, you know, the ancestors and compared to uh, sort of imperial rituals and that. So I think this is a whole new area. You know. I liked anthropology. I did one unit in it as an elective way back in the 70s. It was on the evolution of religions. Uh, very interesting stuff, you know, from the Nile Delta and the apex of pyramids right through the Twin Towers in America in modern context. So it's sort of a Hertzberg hierarchy. Um, yeah, the medieval millennial movements. So, uh, you know, if you want to see the future, that's, you know, uh, Norman Cohen, I think, wrote it, Pursuit of the Millennium, the Anabak, the uh, uh, revolts. Uh, mm, we're on the tip of that again, I think. Yeah. Well, it's always bubbling away. So, uh, yeah. And the Charles, Man the Charles Manson cult, that's what I had to. And I got 86 for the essay. So there you go. I should have, I should have just dropped business <laughs> in computing and gone that way. So, uh, yeah. Brilliant young American uh, lecturer. I can't remember his name the other day. So, look, that's the hour and a half up. I don't know what uh, APF want to do, but thanks for the questions and, and the chat. So, yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> and and uh, your health improves and this forward. Just relax and rest and eat well. That's the key thing. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I think I'm getting the aim of your project. It's... Um, so thank you for taking through your thinking processes. Um, and uh, so, and I can really relate to what you've been saying about, you know, and, and what Doris has been saying about how do you uh, work with futures, you know, because we're between worlds. We've got a clash of worlds going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, so, but I was wondering what, uh, so, I think I'm getting the aim of your project, but what's your purpose? You know, what's the purpose that you're trying to achieve for yourself in your life? Like in addressing this whole um, futures um, complexity that we're all dealing with. Okay. Um, look, to be honest, the elephants are a Trojan horse. Um, you know, part of research needs to be grounded. Um, part of the story of uh, my Sri Lankan visit was I attended a couple of festivals. I know this sounds tangential, but uh, in the end, I grew up in a rural thing, so you know, animals are not a strange thing. I'm happy. Uh, there's some fantastic, um, around about February time frame in Colombo in Sri Lanka, there's a great pageant and festival which involves a whole lot of elephants and lots of you know, um, theatre. And I managed to attend that. And at the, at the very end of the parade, all the elephants were being loaded back up onto the trucks. And I just hung around because it's pretty relaxed. And um, I could see as the, as the silk skirts and things were lifted up, all these red legs with the chains and the whipping. That goes on. Anyway, this elephant just kind of reached out gently and touched me. I was quite hanging around quite close, so there's no danger. In it. And just I won't, I won't suggest there's anything spooky in it, but I just got this sort of keen sense that the, particularly in Sri Lanka, which is a very strange island, used to be called Serendip, uh, Serendipity, uh, which by the Persians, uh, they used to trade, it was a stopping off point with the trade with Java, it's going right back. Um, that the, the future of Sri Lanka, which is a very sort of tortured island in a, in a way, uh, with civil war, uh, was very much bound up with the elephants, you know, the elephants and the Sri Lankans as a culture, but also as a group of people. Um, so it just sort of came to me, yeah, I'll, I'll do something to help you. That's, that was my inner, inner response, I suppose. So I wouldn't say the elephants were talking to me. Maybe I was just primed for some sort of sense but, uh, and looking for a pragmatic focal point, a grounded research option. But at that stage, I hadn't really thought about uh, elephants as a PhD. That sort of came later in the year when I went to uh, Bangkok and met Sahail again uh, and said to him, well, whatever, whatever, you know, would a PhD work? And he sort of said, come to my workshop and we'll, we'll do something. And that's what came out of it. So, look, um, I think uh, to, to avoid this kind of uh, lost in space, <laughs> you know, Dorothy and Oz abstraction, 
I'm actually, the, the purpose is actually to help elephants survive. But in doing that, it's actually changing human, human approach to the nature and the way and ourselves and our own self-control, not just as individuals, but you know, at the higher governance level. So the elephants are particularly in Asia, on the edge of the cliff. And if they go, it won't just be sort of a, an interesting trauma experience for cultures that rely on the elephant. You know, there's a difference between the elephant is real and the elephant is, was just the dodo bird that used to exist. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. But it also means that on the ground there are real people and real elephants and real farmers trying to eke out a sustainable existence. And the Indian ethic, I'll just call it that as the Hindu-Buddhist ethic, is is sensitive to that in principle. Um, it's and should be able to maintain and find that that nuanced balance between wildlife and human modern human consciousness uh, behavior, whatever it is. So the elephants are kind of like, how do we just ground this down into one one focal point, but having a whole trail of potentials in it? So that's what I think the elephant is. It's a sort of a uh, it's a biological animal. Um, as I've described, uh, but it's it's also like we are a multidimensional entity in this world. And I, what it means, I don't know, but for my research purposes, it gives me a grounding that is uh, both esoteric in, in, in one direction, uh, the Indian philosophies, you know, zero is one way of capturing it within mathematics, but on the other end, it's very pragmatic. You know, what does Eleanor Ostrom's uh, work uh, need to be, uh, which, which is engaged with economics and science <laughs> at, at the pragmatic level. Uh, what does it need to tweak uh, everybody so that we can just do our work better? And so some of it is about corruption, just you know, change of government attitudes, but I think it's ultimately a focus on saving the elephants, um, but also um, reprogramming ourselves to sort of follow what, look at, look at the world with a bit of a Gregory Bateson eye. I mean, he's just one of numbers of people from that generation and that direction that pointed. Um, the trick now is for the, and I'm in sort of the handover mode. I mean, I don't know how many more years I've got left, but uh, I've got two, two adult children and six grandchildren. <laughs> Some of them are driving cars. So for me, it's just an end of life. What do I do? And I think the answer is through, you know, I understand the world through cybernetics, through Bates and, and others of the 70s and the 60s. That's just my background. But it's it's like it's like speaking Sanskrit. It's a dead language, you know. It's 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 like Latin. It's, it's precision. It's got the it's got the precision behind it, uh, but it's not it's not cool, you know. It's not uh, it's not de, de rigueur. So this is where I think future studies in Sahel, particularly, but others, really are able to carry that that knowledge that precision forward, but in a very modern, trendy, acceptable format, the, the metas, metaphors for the young. Like I said, you know, in, in the past, they put I on Y to say it was an imaginary number, you know, something a bit smelly on the end you don't worry about. Um, today, if it was discovered today, we'd just put a smiley face there. You know, it's, that's what the way, that's a sort of a approach. So it's like, what's the problem? How do we find the modern uh, communication technologies? This is what Margaret Mead was talking about. And then how do we find the, the venue, the stages where the spotlights are? and help the actors, you know? So it's, yeah, I suppose you can you be a futurist as an actor or you can be a yeah. futurist as a scriptwriter, yeah. So Does thank that you Sorry. for um, letting me know about, you know, the elephant and your purpose that you feel that's underlying. And I look really forward to, and I, I must admit, I see the end of life as when we do our most important work. Not, yeah. uh, I think the illusion is, with the youth, but it's when we do our most important work. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how the elephant brings forward uh, your next work and, and <laughs> the purpose of your life when you'll start to see, oh, is that what it's all about? Oh, that's where I've been traveling, yeah. When you invited us to ask the questions, I would write the question and then Russell would answer it. And then I would write the next question and he would answer that, which actually meant I was pretty engaged because, um, you know, I was I was actually following along. Um, so I just want to leave with it, with a comment more than a question, because, um, you know, I have I have been dealing with. First of all, I'm a former, you know, mathematical, logical philosopher who got steeped into pragmatism. So I loved how you so sort of interwove 
you know, philosophical mathematics with uh, pragmatism's, uh, you know, abduction. Um, where I'm still, I just have to think about it. I don't think it's that you didn't answer it, but where I still have to think about it is, is how you then create this system that gets beyond the dualisms. And, and that was my question at first was, okay, so how do you break out of the dualisms? I think you have, but I'm not sure how, <laughs> you know, it, it was. <laughs> um, and so um, I think that's a huge contribution and I'm not sure there's time to really answer that but, but I do think what you've done is really exactly putting together the pieces that need to be put together to sort of get into sort of this post, post, post era, whatever that be. Whatever, yes. Okay, well, thank you. Look, I, I, I'm rather technically literate, so I wasn't reading the chat and I had everything set up so there was no technical chance of going off the page. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, people just need to read out of it. Um, I don't have an answer to that. I, I, I think I just found these keys along the way and obviously others have done it. Um, all I would say is that uh, I would just call it the Indian ethic to make it simple, um, is actually a trinary system. I mean, it's been the case since uh, the time of Buddha uh, before uh, the sixth century or whatever. And so really with the, uh, in the Indian case, the British colonial system, we really have a very complex uh, approach where Technology and the British system, the European system, uh, flourished in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, but India, and it was using science and engineering that was used, was was leveraged off the zero that really came out of the Indian thinking. Uh, but they don't recognise it now. This is a, a sort of an area of uh, uh, Santos, I think, and others call it the sort of colonial blindness. But look, I, I, I'm not interested in the blame, I'm just interested in unpacking a complex problem and solving it. I sort of came through an IT background, so I've got a legacy there that I can, that helps me out with, with the way mathematics is pragmatic. So if India is a growing population and Asia is moving forward uh, economically and socially and culturally, then the question is, um, how does the Western world, as we are in some areas, or as this I am, how do we interface these East and West areas? And I just think uh, rather than getting lost, certainly outside my pay grade in terms of the philosophies of it, I just found that the physical elephant and the links to the symbolic meanings of these in the Indian uh, worldview, Buddhist and Hindu worldview, is a way forward that is attractive to and, and in a sense part of the business problem. Uh, that's why I used uh, Peter Sandman's uh, total risk. I actually uh, worked in the department in a department of mines at the time I was in IT, but um, the local regulatory group, uh, several people were being killed in mines, and they found that uh, the engineers were just looking at the problem as an engineer. You know, the, the pole wasn't thick enough. Someone didn't follow safety procedures, and so they ran the engineers, the whole engineering uh, uh, division, through this Peter Sandman course, saying. There's a political aspect to this. It's the outrage as well. And in effect, that's just stuck with me. And I recognized it's this complex, uh, what the mathematicians took 360 years to, to put together in a sense in a process is actually the way forward. And I think it's what Bateson is talking about in terms of the, the mental system we need, uh, both respects the, the, the uh, binary Cartesian approach, which is very effective in math, in uh, in uh, science and engineering, but at the same time, it also uh, frames it within a more holistic approach. Uh, and we can get above all the tribalism and all the disciplinary uh, sort of biases and focuses, which are natural, uh, using something like mathematics, certainly not mathematics as science and engineering do. Um, that's, that's, they've already gone ahead 100 years, but in terms of its aesthetic, and I just think that it, that just leaves so many people behind because it's it's captured by science. And if more students, because in a sense, the answer isn't the elephants. The answer is the research scientists in conservation, human, uh, geography, uh, any any area intersecting with elephant human uh, uh, conflict. It's it's those people being able to uh, be more literate in, in seeing uh, 
uh, the problem outside their own domains. And I just think futures is just a prime area, particularly if I if I use Sahel's work, it's you know the interpretive, the empirical, uh, the subjective, and, and we're all walking around the same issue. How do we do this? And all I'm saying is it's the way mathematicians approached it and all the denial and all the grief and all the process stages, which I think varies quite well with a, in a sense, a, a death of paradigm. That's really what I'm talking about. As, you know, it's, it's more a macro history view than, than a futures view, but uh, people play in both spaces. So look, I, I, I'm just having fun. I don't have an answer to it, but I think if people, if we can, if we can frame, can frame and construct it in that way, and I am looking at the pragmatics of it, which is a fundamental one for, of the Western modern world. Uh, just saving the elephants is important. And if they do go extinct, what does that mean for uh, the Hindu and the Buddhist and the others that, that see it? So that, that, I don't have an answer. I just think using Eleanor Ostrom's pragmatic uh, uh, SES model, uh, it's accepted at the UN, it's accepted across science, it's an, open, it's an open door for futures people who want to get in there and go, what you need is more targeting and more transformational knowledge. Here's my toolkit. Off we go. And 1.4 billion people in India, uh, very well educated, with a history of this trinary model. It's not foreign to them. That's who they are. That's what they're proud of. And trying to find a way in which uh, it goes and works for them. Uh, the elites, uh, don't blame you, but Many of the elites in India are obviously educated in Western universities. And so it's a very complex, very complex issue. But I think uh, personally they're up to it. I think it's just a question of, well, how do we get better targeting and look at it, not so much from the philosophical area. I mean, there's, plenty, there's six ways of engaging with this elephant. Elephant as a blind, as a blind human, uh, or this blind in one dimension. Um, but it's about outrage management. And so outrage can just be how do we engage with better marketing? How do we, how do we frame it in such a way that the peasant farmer, or I shouldn't say peasant, but the marginal farmers can actually use technology like mobile phones to get their compensation checks within two or three days from the government that is responsible for the commons, which is the elephant's domain. And so really it comes down to just pulling out these corruption areas and not trying to sort of see them as, as blame, really, but just as parts of a, a complex system that can be fixed, you know, from philosophical perspective, if that's, your, if that's, our, if that's the bent, or from a pragmatic engineering perspective. And I, I guess I'm, I'm moving forward with the pragmatic engineering of the, uh, what I call it, of the metaphors. And I think this is the future's realm as I see it. This is the domain. If, as uh, Carl Goss had said, you know, these biased metaphors weren't used originally as imaginary numbers within the so-called hyper-rational uh, enlightenment or European enlightenment, then perhaps our great-grandmothers would have been going shopping on uh, Back to the Future hoverboards. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's a mind, it's a mental exercise. But the question is, where are we now? And that's what I was trying to project with this projection thing. Where are we now in this grief cycle? It's just another, another frame exercise. But how, how can we be sure that we're not automatically doing as part of this zero learning, we just do it because we've done it? Um, that the current metaphor, the science of metaphors, and the engineering of metaphors, if we can, if we can address that and accelerate that so there's more harmony, then uh, we might be able to move into the futures uh, quicker. Because I don't think we've got 360 years. Uh, at least I don't think the elephants have if we don't change. So that's my position. Which I'm trying to descend. So thanks for the question. Uh, best of people just ask, because I, like I said, I didn't, I didn't read the chat. And I don't want to really go there because uh, <laughs> if I press the wrong buttons, I'll end up in, uh, with technical problems. So. Um, no more additional questions, Russell, but we do have comments that uh, they love the fraud triangle um, and uh, that they enjoy the presentation and the use of multiple models to address a real problem. Right, okay, that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no other questions, um, perhaps you can uh, give us a few closing remarks before we end. 
Um, thank you for the positive uh, comments, Pat. And uh, look, um, welcome to this space. Um, let's find some of these elephant sanctuaries that are working. There's a good one in Thailand uh, that deals mainly with the, with the uh, female elephants and uh, the one in Cambodia, the male elephant, and a couple in Brazil. And I find them a joy in the morning. You know, all this complexity, there's often just little 10 minute videos of the meeting uh, yams or something like that. And, and you'd be surprised. Um, um, so look, hopefully it's just come together as a, as a, as a mosaic, mosaic of uh, stained glass windows. And uh, welcome to the elephant complex. Uh, that's all I can say really. So thank you. Sorry for being out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Okay, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining.